Hello, welcome to Vegas Little Library. I'm Tammy Ruff. And I'm Amy Newberry. We're your two librarians discussing all the books in the stacks. The new and notable. The lost and forgotten. The hot and the not. And the not. (laughs) (laughs) So let's get to it. But before we do, listeners, a couple things I want to remind you of. Please go check out our Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter pages because we have some amazing content that lives in those spaces. I have to say I'm getting proud of us. We're getting really good at it. Yeah, nice stories, Amy. Oh, yes. yes. Uh I know I'm working on those. (laughs) Yes. And if you have not signed up for our free newsletter yet, I cannot um, encourage you enough because we have some great little tidbits that are coming out just once a week. So get over to biggestlittlelibrary.net. Excellent. Okay. Okay. I love, I'm so excited about this episode because it's something that is near and dear to both of our hearts. I know. I know. Do you want to tell our listeners? Well, we're going to be talking about library books. I know. (laughs) As in books about libraries, reading, and books about books. Exactly. I know, because it is... It is Read Across America Week. And Dr. Seuss's birthday. It is. I wonder how many people have been inspired to read because they touched a Seuss book in their childhood. Mm -hmm. I'm just, I'm wondering, is it millions, billions? Where are we at? Where are we at? Yeah, I wonder. Probably hundreds of millions, if not billion. He must be translated into... That almost rhymed, like... (laughs) A Seuss book? I know. Oh, look at you getting all clever. Millions or billions or trillions. There you go. (laughs) Easy, easy. She's on fire tonight. Yeah. Um, But how many, I was going to say, what I was saying was, do you think he's translated in how many different languages? I'm kind of curious now that I question myself. Oh, yeah. I don't know how many, but it's got to be a lot because I know in our own catalogs, there have been, you know, there have been some you know, different yeah. mark records that have, yeah. is that really in Korean or is that really, in, <laughs> you know, they've had to st- kind of straighten well, that out. But. I know that the biggest population resides in China and I'm just wondering if Seuss books have any allure or pull in China, you know? Well, you know what I'm going to do, friend? Are you going to look it up? I am. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't know how we got on this riff, but I just all of a sudden started thinking about it and how many kids are impacted by the rhyming, you know, yes. the rhyming vibe of yeah. Seuss. So I'm going to see what they tell me if there's... Yeah, tell me because I'm curious. Yeah. Okay. So I have an answer for you. Okay. Your question. 20 different languages. Really? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yes. I know we have the obvious. Does it tell you what languages? Um, it does not. Oh, well, 20. Yeah. I'm sure. Mm-hmm. I'm sure there's the major ones in there. It says he wrote more than 60 books during his lifetime, selling more than 600 million copies. 600 million. Mm-hmm. The classic Green Eggs and Ham, the fourth best-selling English language children's book of all time. Wow. Won a total of, oh, has a total of only 50 words. That's funny. But I'm sure they're like word wall words, you know, where there's just, there's a thousand words or something like Mm -hmm. that, or a hundred words that are the most important. Important. Uh Uh-huh. Okay. So, well, interesting languages. Interesting side note. Yeah. Okay. So I read a great book and I know, well, okay. I read a mediocre book. I'm just going to be honest. I liked it. I didn't love. What did you end up reading? Well, I read the library book. Look at all your little post-it notes. But I know. (laughs) It's like little flags out the side (laughs) by Susan Orlean. And she actually is the author of The Orchid Thief, which now I want to go back and read. But I remember hearing about the kind of the, um, I guess it's really the theft that's in the orchid industry so really yes apparently that is i know you're like really you're gonna read that okay but is this one of these micro histories that we were talking about the other day probably okay that is so bizarre that people would want to steal orchids but Mm -hmm. i think you should read it and report Mm -hmm. back to me because it does sound kind of interesting can i ask you a question did you love that book i actually really enjoyed it Okay. It's a four, maybe even a 4.5. And the reason it isn't really a five is that I wouldn't reread it okay. because once I've read it, I feel like I, I've you gained that needed. information mm-hmm. because it is nonfiction. Mm-hmm. So I feel like that is, you know, within my memory to remember those things. Mm-hmm. And I'm hoping, friend, that you and I can do an on the fly and go to L.A. I know. Because this is Central Library in L.A. I and know. if we can get there, I really want to set us up with some of the departments that they have there. Okay. So that we're not just visiting, you know, walking through the gorgeous building. Right. The Good Who building. But that we can visit with some of the librarians and, and really learn about the things they're doing there now. Because this book was out in 2018. So my mom loved that book. I gave it to her, I think, for Christmas or something. 
something. Did I give it to you? Yes, I was going to say you just you gave it to me too for either I must Christmas have bought or it my for, birthday, <laughs> yeah. which is around Christmas. So I yes. must have like gone on a binge. I think I actually bought them in the yeah. same year. Actually, now that I think about that, yeah. you and my mom both got them, mm-hmm. um, and I've had it for like for the couple years too, and I just haven't gotten to it. And then Debbie Steers from mm-hmm. episode. 51, 53, we always, every right, time 53, we do this, it's 53, you're right. She gave us a, a copy of it. Yes. And I'm so, I haven't read it yet. And here's my thing. I have not had like a, I haven't had a five read yet and I'm mm-hmm. feeling a little sad about it because we're yes. in March and I haven't had a five read yet. I'm not sure I have either. So I have to think about that. If I don't get a five read soon, <laughs> I'm going to lose my mind. Right. I just, right. I need something that I'm like, this is gorgeous. And I just, I was, I don't know, maybe I should have taken that book, but I don't want to steal all the good reads. So what did you love? Why don't you tell us what you loved about that book? Well, I won't spoil it for you okay. so that you can still read it because I think you should read it. I appreciate that. Yeah. Because, you know, I think when the book came out, we all thought that it was really about the fire that happened on April 29th, 1986. I did. It's not just about the fire. It is what drew her as a professional journalist mm-hmm. who has written for the New Yorker. Uh, it's what interested her in the library in the first place. But it really is an ode to libraries and librarians. Oh, so oh, thank you, Susan Orlean. I know. So the organization is really, you know, she talks about the fire. Mm-hmm. She talks about that day in, you know, in the, in the library itself and what was kind of going on and what people in different departments were doing mm-hmm. and the fire alarm going off and the age of the building. And, you know, it had, it was early morning and there were about 200 people in there and how they left and they left things on their desks and took off because they thought, well, it, you know, that happens all the time. Right. The alarm system goes off. And I think in, in education that happens to all us. the time. Mm, and I remember when we left our classroom and then the firemen were above of our classroom. Do you remember? It, yes. And I'm, <laughs> like and I'm thinking, hmm, I left my phone on my desk. My keys. <laughs> my keys, my purse. And the bell I was about to, to ring. We were like, uh, six periods almost I over. I have to pick up my kids. I know. Elementary I know. School. So that's what happened there where they, the librarians all left and there's like a hundred and something librarians there. So this is huge. Wow. Mm-hmm. And so she uses that event and intersperses in in sort of dealing out to you, you know, these tiny little chapters mm-hmm. about the person they think possibly did it, and about the investigation and how that how the and there is an arc, so you mm-hmm. you do find out about the person and about the investigation, and there right. there really is a conclusion to that, which I I won't talk too much about because honestly you still want to read it. So right. that has to happen organically where you read those chapters about that particular person and, you right. know, then, you know, the resolution of that issue. But then she has really the history of Central, it's called the the Central Library mm-hmm. uh, and it's in downtown Los Angeles. And it is a gorgeous building, which, you know, my my um, history background. You, I, yeah, you went and looked at it. Didn't yes, you? Central Library. Oh, I did a deep dive in the architect <laughs> because then I was like, well, what else has he done? And where is that? So I did do the deep dive and it is a good hue building. And it was, um, you know, built in the, or not built in, but because it, it took a long time, but in the late 20s. And it has a pyramid on the top, which, you know, history me. I'm like, I'm sorry. Right now I feel like I should just salute your book nerdiness. I know, right? Thank you. I'm thinking to myself, why does he have a pyramid on the top? So then I do the deep dive in it and he'd gone to Egypt and Howard Carter found Tut's tomb in 1922. So in the latter twenties to include that in, in your building, that's pretty like avant-garde. That's really, you know, pretty cool. And so it is a beautiful, beautiful library with the pyramid on the top and the light of learning on top. And it's full of sculptures and it has sphinxes and it has, you know, statuary and it's beautiful and it's huge. And it's very, it's very like firm in its space, I will say. And it's in downtown LA. So I will stop waxing poetic about know, the architecture. I know, we're nerdy now. I know, but Susan spent... I can't remember how many years, at least six, if not eight, researching this. She went to library conferences. She went to library conferences domestically and abroad. We could have run into her. We could have. We could have. We've been been rolling with the librarians for a while. We have. (laughs) 
Okay. And so she's learned a lot. She really wanted to do a deep dive into the library and how they got started. The services that were, you know, the first services that they had, who were the first librarians who were, who were in charge of it? You know, how did their programs grow? Where are libraries today? Where will, will libraries be in the future? And so interspersed in, in this book are pictures of the first librarians. And I'm going to show you one because I'm going to show a picture of her. Okay, this she was eighteen. Me of the class that I took with Karen, you remember? <laughs> yes, <laughs> she came oh. really, really fired up about mm-hmm. renegade librarians. <laughs> so this is Mary Foy. Okay, and I'm and she's eighteen. So she was a librarian, head librarian for Central Library. Did she library. ride her horse places and deliver no, books? No, but you see that bag that's yeah. across her shoulder. She has a cross shoulder bag. Yeah. That's her fine bag. So when she collected fines for people who turned in, shut things. up. <laughs> Wait, I love that. I Give know. me a penny, kid. <laughs> exactly. I love it. So that was one of the, and I have so many things that are tabbed here that I won't go into it, but there, it's very political, okay. right? Who is in charge of Central Library? They had a character uh, who wore a wide whale uh, corduroy suit and this kind of sombrero cowboy type hat right. and had no library skills whatsoever. And he was in charge of it, all politics, you know, so it's... What, what time frame was that, like... He was in, I think he was in the thirties. Okay. Cause I'm like, if it's like, of course a man, no, no offense oh. to our men. <laughs> Absolutely right. no offense, but you know, there has been some historical, you know, evidence of men be, having more control yeah. than women well, during, and, and during she, the thirties in particular. <laughs> she goes back in, into this story too, and talks about how really men were the librarians at the time. I was just going to say, when do you think that that flipped that? Because if you think about Melville Dewey, Mm -hmm. who we know was not the most upright individual. So we're not glorifying him. We're just acknowledging that he did set up the Dewey Decimal System Mm -hmm. and was kind of, you know, important. When did that switch over to become a more feminine? Because now when you think about a librarian, the first thing you think of is a woman, generally. Don't you think? Right. Well, I would say that before the turn of the 20th century... Um, there were men and then women started getting involved in it. And then the women were kind of replacing some of the men who were doing other things. And right. then I think it's in big city libraries. I think you see more men right. than we do like right. in high school, you know, middle school or elementary school. But well, it's funny because um, most people, when I tell them <laughs> I'm a librarian, they look at me and they think, <laughs> Well, you're rather tame, aren't you? I mean, they don't understand that most, well, we're, li- we're wild librarians, I, I think. Right. Renegade library. That's what we do. We kind of <laughs> exactly. keep things very fresh and chaotic around here. Mm-hmm. So, but it's, it, you can kind of, some people look at me and be like, huh, I don't see you as a librarian. And I'm thinking, well, what, what image do you have exactly of a librarian? And then everybody assumes when I say I'm a librarian, that I'm a librarian in an elementary school. Did you ever get this when, before you retired? Right. Yes. And they make that yes. assumption. And then sometimes mm-hmm. people will be like, oh, you mean you have a teaching credential? I'm like, right. yes, because that is what you have to have to be a high school librarian. You have to be a teacher too. Right. And I think, I think everyone has sort of that idea of a librarian with their hair in a bun yes. and glasses on a chain, you know, yes. that kind of thing. And wearing and the shushing. funky, the funky <laughs> sweaters with like, uh-huh. you know, um, what is that stuff they sew on? What do they call that when you applique oh yes yes and puppy right. paint applique mm-hmm, mm-hmm. cats with books or something <laughs> right right so yeah you know these there were groundbreaking women who were in charge here and then a few men and it's kind of I would say oh gosh probably since the 1970s um it's been really more women than men hmm. but now well, I really feel like okay. Remember when we went to our meetings? We had one librarian, which we're going to try to get him on. Yes, one librarian mm-hmm. who would show up, and I think it's different in schools mm-hmm. versus like the county public, library system, public, the yeah. public and uh, academia. Too. I would agree. I think there's more men in those than there are in in schools. Yeah, for sure. I think that that's totally mm-hmm. accurate. So. But she does the deep dive in a way that's very entertaining. You know, she does give lots of facts about, 
you know, she goes all the way back to the Nazis and the number, you get the number of libraries that were burned and the approximate number of books that they burned and things like that. That's and, fascinating because mm-hmm. my book does that. Well, she oh. talks about a certain number she's trying to reach because of that. So um, yeah. have you ever heard of the lo- the last bookstore in Los Angeles? Have no. you seen pictures of it? I haven't. Okay, well, when we go visit this library mm-hmm. when COVID ends, right? <laughs> <so>. <laughs> And yes. we can travel again. Mm-hmm. We also have to hit that place up because if you see pictures of it, you're going to be like, oh, wow. it's so amazing. It looks yeah. really cool. So as much as I don't, you know, I'm not a big city girl. You are. I know. <laughs> right. As much as I don't love the big city, mm-hmm. I think we need to probably make a trip down there and go see both those locations. I think so. I'll drive. Okay. Because I don't mind. But um, it's, yeah, I really want to see the downtown. I mean, who goes to downtown LA? I, I thought I had been to downtown LA downtown LA, but I never obviously have. have. So this is, it's beautiful. And I will say, wrapping back to the fire, it was so heart-wrenching, her writing about how the librarians felt after the fire, when so much had been damaged and so much had been destroyed. They really had, they had issues with depression Aww. and many got divorced and Our they, people. I know it's, it really is. They sort of, she sort of followed all of these people and they struggled because they missed the contact with their people. Mm-hmm. And if you think about all the variety of people that you would have in downtown LA, they missed the variety and you know, the homeless are welcomed, yeah, I know. which we, you know, we desperately need to fix that in our, in our country. Yes. Um, and they need to come into the libraries. And so they actually pioneered a lot of social programs to come in and help, you know, their um, homeless populations. And so they missed them. They wondered where they were. They missed the children that coming yeah. in for children's hour. Yeah. So many things because many of them then were placed into satellite branches right. and then they didn't see each other. And I it really was a struggle. That You bring that up. I wonder if we're seeing even across the country, like I'm lucky because I'm back in school. And even though it's hybrid, I'm Mm -hmm. still seeing some kids and I'm seeing faculty. And so I would argue that as much as, you know, there's a lot of fear around the pandemic, it's nice to see people's faces because we've been so secluded. But I know that our libraries have opened and closed and opened and closed Mm -hmm. and not just here in Nevada, not just in Reno, like around the country. And I often wonder how our, our, our people, our librarian people Mm -hmm. are faring you know, because it's, right. re- it is such a relational job. It is such a job that requires us being on property, mm-hmm. you know? I mean, yeah, mm-hmm. I can do things from home and, you know, put out social media and great, great video blogs and things like that. But it's not the same as like a kid getting excited or a person getting excited about the book that you hand them or, oh, I know that thing. Let me find that for you. Right. You know, I think there's a lot of satisfaction in our jobs because, mm-hmm. When we do something, it's usually like we finish it to completion, you know, as opposed to things that lie out there. Right. And it's something that's very immediate. And I think it's hard for librarians in in the educational setting in public schools because you aren't in a department. Uh, So you often are a person of one. And so you don't have the big Zoom meetings maybe with your department. And so you really are by yourself. So you're pretty isolated. And she did, you know, such a wonderful job of talking about all of them. And, um, I, you know, the, the library was closed for, for many years as they repaired it. Mm-hmm. And then they did an addition because they were going to tear it down and then they decided to fix it. Do you feel like it's a book that would speak to our community leaders about why libraries are important? Yes, absolutely. Kind of like Invisible Women, not to circle back around to your favorite book of 2020. Yes, exactly. It it does sing the praises of the importance of a library in a community. And they even talk about in some communities in LA where the library was too small. Mm -hmm. So they built one outside of the neighborhood where kids could actually walk to it. And now what do they do with that crumbling building? Because they built another one, but yet those people in that area still need need it because of course that next new build is not in the same place. So Mm -hmm. there are a lot of things like that. What was interesting to me is the intensity of the fire Mm -hmm. built or burnt at a, at such a high degree that you couldn't see the flame. And I didn't know that was a thing. What? I'm not that sciencey. There was no color to the flame. Because All I it know burned. about firefighting is from the movie Backdraft. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, right. Really? Yeah. No. yeah. It was really interesting that 
the the intensity of the heat and I, it's like stoichiometry or and stoichiometry did it, something did it, like that. Okay, so now I absolutely you've read two books as of late that I feel like were really high rated reads for you. Mm-hmm. That I feel a little pissed that I didn't get to read. <laughs> well, you still can't. And I know. And just on the, like, what do they do with the book thing? They froze all the books that got wet. Really? And to prevent mold from immediately growing. Uh-huh. And then after that, then they would sort of thaw them, but under controlled cir- circumstances. Really? And then determine whether they were still okay and they could, you know, reshelve them or if they needed a new binding. But I thought that was amazing that that's the choice because I wouldn't have known what they did. We usually throw wet books away, right? Because like they're damaged and they do get moldy very quickly, but they froze them So all. here's my next question. I have to circle back. Yeah. Did it get so hot because of the, because of the books? Why did it get so hot? Why did, why were the flames? Can you not tell me that? You look like you don't want to tell me that. I don't want to talk to you okay. about it because okay. that's part of the investigation. Okay. And what could the accelerant have been if this was mm. arson? Mm-hmm. Or is, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But it's, and it, could it have been something with the design of the building that all kind of plays a role? And so I don't want to okay. give too much away. Yeah. But the answer is in, in this book. book. <laughs> so um, I will stop waxing poetic about okay. the library book. So interesting side note. So mm-hmm. when we go to LA to see this place yeah. and the last bookstore, we should probably go to the UCLA bookstore. Do you know Ooh, why? No, why? Or actually Do the tell. library, the UCLA library. Okay. Because Ray Bradbury wrote Fahrenheit 451 at 10 cents an hour. He typed it down in that library does she talk about she that? does talk about it in there you know my boy yes. ray like i love ray bradbury yes. and he's so he was especially later in his life so adorable to like listen to and, and watch his interviews and so i've always been like oh history starting yes. right there he also was instrumental in um really gathering more public funds oh good and i think they had a, tele- a really quirky telethon but he was involved in getting funds donated because there was not enough money to fix the building and restock the number right. you know the hundreds of thousands of books that well were you know what he called anybody who was a book lover and a reader of books you were a librarian i only know that because you told me that mm-hmm. but i lo- and then i watched the the youtube video yeah. that you said so oh I we did. should link that i will in the, the great, show notes from the great american yes. read or something yeah. or the great the big read i think it's the big read yes is what it's I called it is. and they have a video yeah. of him he was the big mm-hmm. read one year fahrenheit so yeah I think okay it's great. i am so, so I loved it. jealous yeah i'm glad you loved i'm really glad you loved Hey listeners, we wanted to take a few seconds to let you know about all the happenings here at Biggest Little Library. Okay, as always, you know we have our newsletter and it's fabulous, so make sure you get over there and sign up for that. But did you also know that we have a spring new release guide? Oh my goodness, you're going to want this thing. It's got 30 books coming out in March, April, and May. And it is something that we give out for free to our Patreon subscribers. There's going to be three more coming this year, so get over there. That's right. Check out our weekly blogs, too. We have so many wonderful book lists there. And finally, we now have a dedicated Goodreads page. Yay! Just for Biggest Little Library. Friend us today. So head on over to BiggestLittleLibrary.net today. It made me think, though, before I launch into my book, because yes. I liked my book, but I didn't, mm-hmm. I didn't feel that way about yeah. my book. Sorry. Um, about plucky librarians. Yes. And oh, there's so many in here. Because I would like to yeah. consider myself, like, I feel like I'm a plucky librarian. Mm-hmm. I got a little attitude and a little sass. Yes. But have you read any books with plucky librarians? You know, I'm not sure if I would call them plucky librarians. Um, I, I I picked a couple of books that were really about books okay. or a bookstore. So many years ago, I read Balzac and the Little Chinese Seamstress. Uh-huh. And it's, of course, it's historical fiction. <laughs> Big shocker. <laughs> it takes place in China after the Cultural Revolution. And um, they have sent people out into the rural areas and they're learning new skills and things. And these two boys find a collection of Western classics that have been translated into Chinese. Oh. And so it's at a time when they, they're not supposed to see anything outside of right. what Mao says, you know, the Chinese culture is going to be. They see all these Western classics of what, what's around the world and the thoughts right. and, you know, all yeah. of these creative things. So that was one. Okay. 
And then there's another one that's been on my to read list. And it's Mr. Penumbra's 24 hour bookstore. Oh, and that's another quirky one where um, I think it's in I think it's in San Francisco Mm -hmm. and Mr. Penumbra's is a bookstore where he tries to follow the owner tries to follow people and then match them with the right book. So why do I feel like I've felt like that was sort of a library. There was one written set in Paris that kind of had that same theme, a book, Mm. like a guy who lived on a boat. Does this sound familiar to you? Oh yes. And he would, it was like a bookshop on a boat Mm -hmm. in the um, Seine river. Yep. And you, he would match you with the book that was ever your ailment, whatever Mm -hmm. your ailment was, your Mm -hmm. broken heart, your, Mm -hmm. you know, lost cat, whatever that was, he would find, and he wouldn't, like, I don't know that he necessarily got that. I don't know what the title of that is. I don't Do you know, but remember? I'm going to find it and I'll put it in the, <laughs> the show, show notes. notes. It's like the book charmer. She does that too. Yeah. She is a librarian and she gives a book to someone and that person's like, well, I, you know, I didn't, I, why did you, why are you giving me this? I don't think I need this. And she's like, yeah, you do. Mm, just hang on to it. Do and you, then it comes up where they do. So I'm just finishing, we just finished Blind Date with a book, which oh, is kind of nice. like what, that's kind of like, I'm not saying I'm a book charmer and I'm not saying that I have that special gifting or ability, but I would definitely classify myself, as I said, a plucky librarian who likes mm-hmm. to hand the right thing to the right yes. person. And um, so I'm, I'm hoping that I get some good feedback from that. But excellent. I, I, this tangent is just going to keep going. I know. So years ago, a couple of years ago, I handed off a book to a dear friend of mine mm-hmm. who works here okay. and it was Harry's Trees. By John okay. Cohen. Have you read this? No, but you've talked about it. Because there's a plucky librarian in it. Oh, and she's I didn't remember delightful. that. Her name okay. is, um, oh gosh, what is her name? Olive Perkins. And she's kind of, um, on occasion, she like has a foul mouth and she smokes <laughs> a pipe. But she like, get in the, and nobody. A pipe? Yeah. Right. Oh boy. Okay. <laughs> that would not be me. No, or me. <laughs> Maybe the foul mouth part sometimes. But she well, has me too. this sweet little like sweet girl who's just going through so much heartbreak. She always hands her the right book and there's like no business in her, in her library. It's kind of like a dying place. But anyway, my friend that I gave it to said that it was just the right book. Oh. And so I often think of that and I think it's because the plucky librarian part. Sorry. Yeah. I've digressed so far. But that's what we do. We love to match (laughs) books to people. That's, that's that's why we're librarians. I know. And sometimes when you strike it out and like somebody's like, oh my gosh, that was like, strike it out the right metaphor. What would it be? Home when, run it out? Sometimes when you strike out and you yeah, don't get bad. it, it is bad. Yeah. When so when you, you hit, hit a home run, okay. yes. Uh-huh. So when I hit it up, I'm sorry, it has been a long day <laughs> in the library. <laughs> so when I hit it out of the park, I feel really particularly, there's a real satisfaction when somebody comes back in and says that book was so important or so incredible or what, mm-hmm. it, not just that they loved it, but like it was it was the right book at the right time and it spoke to them in a way that is almost spiritual. Do you know what wow, I mean? Wow, yeah. So, okay, so on the flip side of that, yeah. have you ever given someone a book that you love, love, loved? Yeah. And you gave it to them and they came back and they were almost kind of mad yeah. and didn't like it. And then, I'm sorry, but I felt judgy. I was like, well, I don't even know who you are. Well, you know what? You didn't like this. I mean, on the inside, I feel like I want to break up with that person <laughs> as a friend because I'm like, if you don't love this, we got a problem. Right. right. Because I don't hand out crap books. No, this was the most I know hysterical what book. I know what it is. It, it, it was a David Sedaris book. It was. And I remember. <laughs> and I remember you said the guy you gave it to, and you're like, I'm not, uh-huh. I'm not sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He doesn't live in this state anymore. <laughs> so we can bat him all we want. In a oh. loving, in a loving way. Right. In a loving library. We really aren't that judgy. But that day yeah. I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> How could you not love this genius? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> What's wrong with you? All right. All right. So, so tell so, me, friend, about your, your read. Okay. I picked this up in Phoenix. It's called The Bookshop of the Brokenhearted. And I loved the cover. I'm yeah. totally, I totally buy books because of their covers, which is kind of probably not the greatest algorithm, but it's by Robert Hillman. And I believe he's Australian because it is set in Australia. Oh, okay. And initially when I started reading it, I was like, oh, this is great. Like I picked a winner. That's okay. when I talked to you last. You're like, oh, it's great. It's cozy. And yeah. Then, wah, wah. Wah, wah. <laughs> yeah. And we were up in um, Tahoe as it was dumping feet. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, this is so great. We're in this warm, cozy cabin. And you know, we're having a great time and I'm reading this book and 
it just started to go, I don't know. I don't want to say downhill. So it just wasn't for me. Right. I think a lot of people would probably really like it. And I don't want to sound sexist, but it might, this might come across as sexist. Okay. It was written by a man. Mm-hmm. And similar to my experience with Pillars of the Earth, you know how I feel about that book. I know. I know. There were moments where it digressed and felt very much like something a man would write and I feel like really good writing and maybe maybe I don't even I can I can't even answer this honestly or say this honestly because I'm a woman and I'm experiencing things only as a woman so how would I know but really good writing seems to transcend gender I would agree okay so unless you intend to do right unless you intend to have it be so one way If I read a book and I love it and I hand it off to my husband and he's like, wow. And we have that same experience. There's like a, you don't feel like, oh, a woman wrote it or a man wrote it or Mm -hmm. what the protagonist, was he a man or a woman? Like you don't feel that. That's not a part of the story. Right. But I felt that in here. Does that make sense? It does. Is that too judgy? No, no. So it's just, it's your interaction with the book, which is why we read. We all. And I have nothing against men, writers or men in general. Like I love men. (laughs) Right. You know, I have one sleeping next to me. Every night. <laughs> not currently in this room. But <laughs> no, I mean, that'd be weird. I know. But it's not even that. It just, it, I just, it just had a kind of a, eh, Yeah. Right. Well, it's okay. So um, it is about a young woman. It's about two people, really. It's about a man who is living in the kind of the farmlands of Australia. And he's married to a wife who is a bit of a piece of work. Mm-hmm. Okay. And she runs off, comes back, she's pregnant. Oh, okay. So this child, Petey, inter- enters the story. But what this man, um, Tom, Tom Hope is his name. I love his oh, name. Okay. So what Tom discovers is that he's not necessarily like he wants to be a better husband, but he doesn't think he's a very good husband because his wife ends up leaving. Mm-hmm. And so he struggles with that. And he's like, I should have been better, but whatever. He's She's gone and out of the picture. He, and she leaves the child with him. But okay. he feels like he's a really good father. That that's something he's good at. I like that. And he loves his child. And that was the part where I was like, oh, this story is great. Mm-hmm. Then we need to we meet another character, and that character is uh, Hannah. Okay. And Hannah is she's come from really Poland, but she's a Polish um, Jew. Okay. And she was picked up. This is set in like the '60s, but she was picked up during the Holocaust Mm -hmm. and taken to Auschwitz. She survives it. Oh. But she ends up deciding that she needs a whole new land to live in because there's just so much pain Mm -hmm. and memories and everybody that she loved, she lost. Right. And so reading and an intellectual conversation were very much a part of her growing up. But then, of course, Auschwitz and then trying to reestablish herself. Mm-hmm. And she ends up in Australia and she ends Good up. Good choice. In, I'm just going to say. <laughs> oh, I know. Good choice. I know. She ends up in Australia. She ends up in hometown is what it's called. This little town outside of the place where Tom has his farm. And she decides she wants to open up a bookshop. Oh, Perfect. And many people are kind of like, huh, well, do we, people don't really read around here, which I think is probably a pretty familiar thing in small towns. Do mm-hmm. people, you know what I mean? Not that they don't read, but just can a bookshop survive given the size of the population? Right. So she meets Tom because Tom is doing some work for her in the shop. And at this time, Tom is single and doesn't have the child anymore because of something that's happened. So they end up, their stories, their paths cross, okay. cross together and... I think for me, um, a couple of things that I didn't love, and this could be, I've read so much World War II historical fiction. Yes. I'm a little tired of it. Yes. Do you know what I mean? Oh, yes. Yeah, because I think we've had this conversation (laughs) in our book club before where we're Mm -hmm. like, let's not pick another World War Mm -hmm. II. Nothing against, like I, I binged that. I would say that is definitely one of my micro genres. Yeah. That time period historical fiction, Mm -hmm. because I've loved it. Right. So I think I was like a little tired with that part of the story. I was very interested in how she got to Australia and she had this goal of selling um, 25,000 books because that was significant to her from her life back in Europe with Hitler burning books. And so there was that part to it. And the books, of course, were great because she's, of course, getting Tom to read, as every great librarian does. Exactly. She's like, hands him great expectations as the first book out. And I'm like... 
Hannah, I don't know if that's a good idea. <laughs> that's that's a real thinker. Think. You know? Right, right, right. It's a little bit like long sentences there. Yes, true. But Very true. he ends up loving it. And then they have like great conversations, which of course I love. Yes. And then she gives him crime and punishment. And again, I'm thinking, oh. Hannah. Not back it good- on up. <laughs> Walk it back, Hannah. Walk it back. Yes. So um, Robert Hillman, the author, clearly wanted to drop all the, the classics. <laughs> the tomes, the weighty yeah, tomes. Yeah, the weighty tomes into the writing of the mm-hmm. piece because he talks about Down and Out in Paris and London, which I've never read. 1984, thumbs up on that because yeah. I'm, I'm mm-hmm. a big fan of that. And then Sons or Fathers and Sons, a lot of Russian writers. Mm, I don't know that one. I don't either, but it's Turgenev. I don't even Good know if job. I, A plus I, on the I, pronunciation. <laughs> not even right. Mm-hmm. But I'm like, I know that I don't want to read that. No. You know. Uh-uh. So at the end, I will say this. I think that if you are a person who loves historical fiction, and if you love things set in Australia, which I actually might, that might be a new micro like, oh, right. genre for it, me. Mm-hmm. Like I like things set in certain locations. Yes. Um, you might enjoy this because there is... There's a, there's a great story of like how you heal brokenness that is mm-hmm. so deep and really like not just like it's an entire generation and right like ethnicity of, of a population. You know what I'm saying? Like how do you heal that? How do you heal the brokenhearted of people who've lost somebody who's very significant to them, like a child? So, well, I'm interested in Australia. You know, I, I know. I'm interested in the Aboriginal experience uh, and, right? and what the struggles they've been through because they're you know, the Aussies are delightful people, but they didn't treat their native peoples well, like the Americans do right, not right, and don't. Right. So, well, I mean, yeah. I, probably if you land in any country in the world, they, there's yes. a story as old as that, right? Yes, true. There was a long time ago, I, wa- I watched this show on Netflix. I don't, I know it's not on there anymore. It was like, oh gosh, what was it? it she was walking a camel across the continent of Australia. And I feel like it was a true story. Hmm. And she wrote a book about it. So I'm going to find out what it was, but right. I was hook, line and sinker in on this, this Netflix movie or documentary because it was just fascinating to see somebody walk across. I mean, Australia is big right. and right. hot and dangerous. Yes. So, yes. The most dangerous things in the world yeah. are all there. Yeah. And she made it to the Indian you. ocean side. Interesting. Yeah. And yes. at the end of the movie, you see her in the camel getting in uh-huh. the water. It was very, it was very moving. Yeah. I don't know what it was I called, but right. yeah, but there you go. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I thought you were going to tell me that the camel was carrying books. (laughs) That's where, which you're such a wife. I know. (laughs) In my book, she does talk about that. And there's a donkey in my book too, friend with the books. I know, I know. I know. I was going to try and find the picture and then I forgot. But yes. I think that sounds like a good thing. Donkeys carrying books to Mm -hmm. kids or Mm -hmm. people, humans. So overall, I would say that the bookshop of the broken hearted by Robert Hillman is a decent read. It's a good read. And I think a lot of people will really enjoy it. Mm -hmm. It just did not like tick all my boxes. So right. And that happens. I think that's why we talk about books is that, you know, you pick up something and you really are judging it by the cover Mm -hmm. or by the inside jacket. And People are paid a lot of money to yeah. make that sound spectacular. And sometimes it just doesn't play out as, as much well, as you thought it would. Well, I will say this. I think he has a lyrical quality to his writing. Okay. So I enjoyed that. It lost that pacing at points mm-hmm, for mm-hmm. me, which is, I think, when I was like, uh, right. you know. Right. So, and then I don't know if you see this in here, but this is my birthday gift from Katie. You know, I was going to ask you about your lovely book. Do you see what it mark. says? Oh, yes, <laughs> I do. We can, I think we can say that. Can I? I think so, yeah. Okay, so I'm just going to tell you listeners, it's a silver spoon that's turned into a book holder. Mm -hmm. So it's hammered flat. Yes. And it like slides in. It's great. Mm -hmm. And it says, hold my spot, bitch. (laughs) (laughs) So I think it's great. My 19-year-old sent that Mm -hmm. to me for my birthday. I love it. Oh, she's sweet. I'm going to take a picture and put it on Instagram, but I was waiting until like my birthday. Yes. You know. Yes. Which Hasn't happened yet, but by the time this drops, it has. Exactly. So go on the back of our Instagram (laughs) photos, you'll see the post. It's really cute. And I'll tell you, oh my gosh, did I lose the card where I got it from? I'll have to, it was an Etsy purchase. So I'll find out where you can get it it because I think people are going to want to, I thought, how hard could it be to make these? Should I go into business and make, this would be cool. Can I tell you that I have the alphabet that you I bet hammer you, in? I knew you would. <laughs> this you would be the person. I thought if anybody has the tools to make uh-huh. this happen, it'd be Tammy. 
I know we have all stuff. And I thought you probably even have about, I don't know, some silver spoons laying around because of a state sales or something like that. Yes. Aren't these cute? It's adorable. I love it. I wish I thought of it. If you made it for just friends and family for Christmas, Mm -hmm. like what a great idea. Mm -hmm. I just don't have any tools to make this happen. Well, if you want to do it this summer, you get some spoons and we'll have a day at my house. That would mean I'd have to garage sale. Okay, we're going to, but hopefully we're able to garage sale. We can't do any normal things. Yeah. Then I have to find silver spoons. And you know, they closed that antique store down. I know. We know. They did. Mm-hmm. I'm so sad. Well, you can get them all online. Just go on <gasps> eBay. Okay, I'll do that. Anyway, what was? <laughs> maybe. Sorry, I mean, sorry like, everybody. Sorry. Yeah. There you go. All right. So you read the book I wanted to read. I'm jealous. Yeah. It's called The Library Book by Susan Orlean. And mine was The Bookshop of the Brokenhearted by Robert Hillman. And you guys, we just want to encourage you to get out there and really support your libraries. Yes, and sign up for our newsletter. Yes. <laughs> Because we're going to have all kinds of tips and tricks in there, such as how to get that great bookmark. That's right. <laughs> all right, listeners. Before we go, check us out on social media, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And we know you like us, so we want to encourage you to go over to Podchaser and CastBox and leave us a review. This helps others find our show. And if you're listening on Apple, click on the link in the show notes below. And we'll see, see you in, in the stacks. stacks.